Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Oscar Liburd. He's from the University of Florida IFAS Entomology and Nematology Department. Um, he is professor and program leader of fruit and vegetable entomology with over 15 years experience. And hopefully he can get back on. I turned off his video before. Um, <laughs> let's see. I if turned can... off briefly to get myself together here, but oh, okay. I'm gonna be back oh, on good, very good, shortly. Good, good, yeah. good, all right. He's going to be talking about vineyard insect pest management. So to, add, uh, to answer your question, Juanita, we will add that production guide soon to our uh, ex, uh, extension website. We okay. Want, yeah, there, there, is a lot, there are a lot of information available, especially in Southeast, and we want to get, gather everything in that website and provide the link to our group. Great. Thank you. Looks like Dr. Leibert is ready to go. And um, I'm going to turn off my video. Oh. Okay, good afternoon. Again, I'm Oscar Liburd. I'm a professor in the entomology department. Let me see if I can stand up here. And uh, I've been with IFAS for quite some time, almost 20 years, working in all of the, the fruits and some of the vegetables. Um, you know, I work in uh, the blueberries and grapes and blackberries and strawberries and so forth and, and, and quite a few of the vegetable crop. So um, today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, pest management in grapes, and uh, I'm going to focus on what we call the key pests uh, in grapes, muscadine grapes, I should say, because um, the hybrids and the, the the northern varieties tend to be a lot more susceptible to insect attack, and um, you know if I was covering that part of it, I would have included a lot more insect pests. But for muscadines, and we grow quite a bit, uh, most of our crop down here is muscadine, um, they're, they're a little bit more hardy or more resistant to, to pests, to insect pests. So I'm focusing on those um, key ones. And um, I, wanna, I wanted to start out by talking about grapefruit borer. I think a lot of you have heard quite a bit about grapefruit borer, but I'm going to you know, summarize some of the information that we have and some of the research that we have done in, in this area. And then I'll talk about um, a little bit on the trap and why we chose that type of trap. And then what happens when you have adjacent woodlands um, next to a vineyard, how this affects um, population of grapefruit borer. And then I'll talk about um, some of the work we have done looking at pesticides to control borers and also um, uh, this the second pest that I'm going to talk about which is grape vine aphids and grape vine aphid is a, has, has been around for a very long time but recently within the last five years or so we saw it quite a bit um, on muscadine and creating some problems for us here in Florida and Georgia and so forth. And then we're also going to talk about identifying some of those compounds to control the, the grapevine aphid and, and the effects of some of these newly registered products um, on some of the biocontrol agents that we have been using on the aphid itself. And then towards the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about some other occasional pests that we see in muscadine grapes. So let me start out with a uh, grapefruit borer. And, um, you know, as I said, I've been around here for quite some time. When I first arrived in Florida, I was very excited about this pest because I've done quite a bit of work um, on, on firm round pest management. And I realized this one was very much adapted to firm round pest management. And I did um, quite a bit of this work at Michigan State University um, 20 years ago, so to speak. So I was excited and I, was able to, to make some accomplishment. But let me tell you a little bit about uh, grapefruit borer first. Um, 
I guess it's native to the southeastern part of the United States. Um, it's a it's a day flying moth, and um, quite a few people don't realize it's a moth. Um, it, in fact, it's referred to as the clear winged day flying moth because the the wings tend to be clear, and um, the adults obviously only flies during the day, and um, it tends to mimic what we call the paper wasp, which I'm gonna show you in the next slide. This is the female. Uh, you can see the abdominal structure of the female looking completely different to the male, where the male has these claspers, and these claspers are used to, to, um, to really clasp onto the female so that it doesn't move after the, the mating process um, has started. Uh, I should tell you, uh, even though these are day flying moths, um, it's very difficult to find, to walk out into your vineyard and find grape root borer or dogs. Uh, in fact, um, we always run into the, to the male moth because we are using the pheromones from the female to attract the male, but we never ever find the female. It's very difficult to, to run into the female itself. Now I'm showing you this um, paper wasp. I, I, as I told you, it resembles the paper wasp. Uh, the, you can, un, unless you have some entomological training, you can barely tell the difference between them. Um, but a very easy way to do it. Um, uh, by the way, this one is a beneficial insect, the paper wasp. It's it's, it's a predator. In other words, it's, it's feed on other insects, and it also. Um, influences pollin pollination within the, the vineyard itself. So it's a beneficial insect. But an easy way to distinguish between the, the predator or the beneficial insect and the pest is that if you look very closely at the waistline of it, you'll realize it's, it's constricted. It's very, very small. It has a very small waistline and a very thick um, abdomen, so to speak. Whereas in the case of the grape root borer, the abdomen, you know, is the same size um, throughout. Uh, but I'm, I'm telling you this because um, I've been called several times to, to vineyards where they think they have um, root borer pro problems. And when I get there, I realize um, the, the vineyard is, is rich with, with beneficial insects or, or um, predators and or pollinators. So what it does, um, the and I'll talk about the, the life cycle you know, in, in another two slides or so, but um, the, the, in the, throughout the life cycle, there's a larva that is produced and the larva feed on the root system of the grapes. It's, it really likes to feed on older grapes. Um, uh, from my research, um, I, 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 we see much higher population in grapes that's more than four or five years old. Um, although it can attack um, one or two year old grapes. Um, and you can see the larvae embedded within the, the root system. And the larvae actually tends to feed on the, on the roots. Um, and after, you know, six months to two years, up to two years feeding, what could happen depending on the size of the root, the, 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 the vines, um, start tumbling over, so to speak. And not only that, um, the, the root hairs that is responsible for absorbing mineral salts and water and so forth, um, they are disturbed. And as a result, you have in the heat of the sun, these grapes tend to wilt. Um, you know, they're, they're water stress, even though you're providing um, sufficient water uh, with the irrigation system. So uh, this is a vineyard that we worked in several years ago in Florida. Uh, this one was totally infested with, um, with grape root borer. Um, you can see the vines are older. And if you look very carefully, you'd realize that the, the, the leaves um, tends to be pale yellow. This is not water stress problems because um, the, as you can see, the irrigation lines are there and so forth. The irrigation was well provided, but the problem is the roots were so disturbed with grape root borer, um, the roots were not able to absorb any water or mineral salts to support the, 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 the vineyard, the, the, the vines. 
So we have issues related to nutrient and water transportation in, in, in grapes. Um, the, vigor is, the vigor of the plant, you know, the robustness of the plant is also reduced um, because of these um, larvae feeding on the root system. Um, the plant also is more susceptible to things like freeze damage um, because the roots are not clearly embedded down in the soil where it's protected from the freeze, um, from, from the cold weather. And interestingly, what we found from our research is that a single larvae was sufficient to reduce the yield of grapes by 50%. So this is an extremely important pest um, of muscadine grapes, probably it, not probably, it is the most important pest in muscadine grapes. Now, in terms of the life cycle, uh, now, typically it has a two year life cycle. In, in fact, um, I think most of the, of the research, ecological research that is north of Georgia has shown a two year life cycle. Uh, a friend of mine, one of my colleagues that re retired about three or four years ago, Susan Webb, some of you may know Susan Webb, um, she found that a one year life cycle was possible in Florida. Um, we have not seen that yet, but it's, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying to you, it is, according to Susan Webb, it's possible that the cycle in Florida could be maybe one year, but north of Georgia, it's always two years. Um, and, 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 and this pest occurs throughout Eastern United States, you know, um, goes all the way up to, to almost to um, New York area, it's in Ohio, it's in Michigan and so forth. So just to talk a little bit about the life cycle, you, know, you have the, the female um, laying eggs in, in the first summer and um, the, the, it takes about four to five days to lay in these eggs and then the eggs would hatch in about eight to 12 days during the first summer. And then after egg hatch, we have after between eight and 12 days, depending on the temperature and so forth, we have the first instar. And um, the first instar usually occurs in the fall. But it's the first instar, this is when they first start feeding on the grape um, vines, the, the roots of the grape vines in the, during the first winter. And then it overwinters a little bit in Florida, um, especially in December and January and early spring, we have second instars um, that, that develops. Um, and again, a lot of this we see in north of, in Georgia and north of Georgia. And in the second, in the, in the first spring, we have uh, the second instar. And then the second summer, and notice this is one year now, we have the third instar and then in the fall, we tend to have the fourth insta, and all of these insta is a little bigger than the previous insta, but um, and it, as it gets bigger, the feeding uh, intensity tends to increase. Um, the fifth insta is the following spring, um, which is the second year. And then after that time, it goes into a pupation stage where it pupates and it stays there until almost the beginning of summer and then the adults emerge and start laying eggs again where the cycle starts from a two year cycle again. So it's a very complicated cycle. Um, it's a, it, the pest takes a very long time to complete its life cycle. And, um, and man, this makes management extremely difficult. And, and what complicates management also is the fact that the, the pest occurs in the root system of the plant so unless we have some kind of pesticide or some kind of management program that can target the, the larvae in the root system or use some kind of ferment pest management where we can interfere with the behavior of the pest, it can be very difficult to control. So one of the first questions that we ask um, when I arrived here um, in the early 2000s was the fact that we wanted to know how do we monitor this pest? Because there was hardly any information available about monitoring. Um, I think the farmers and also the, the research before I arrived here, most of what they did is, is, is to see the damage and then to spray for the damage. Um, and that is not a very good system, so to speak, to manage um, any kind of pest. You need to be able to monitor it effectively. Otherwise, you're gonna be wasting pesticide and developing problems with resistance and so forth. So um, 
one of the first thing we wanted to find out is how to manage to monitor the pest. And we look at some of the commercially available traps um, for monitoring moths. As I said before, this is a moth, um, Lepidopteran pest. And we looked at wing traps. So we also looked at um, bucket traps. And um, this is a green bucket trap, which is commonly used for monitoring Lepidopteran pests or, or moths. Um, and in this trap, we put a, uh, what we call a pesticide strip. And this is the, pe the purpose of the pesticide strip is to kill the, the adults or the moth as it flies into the trap itself. In the trap, we put um, a fermion law. This is the fermion law here. Uh, this is the bucket trap and this is the wing trap. And inside the wing trap, we put also a fermion law. We wanted to see and compare the differences between these two types of traps. Remember this one costs about, a, a, the, the wing trap costs about $1.75, the bucket trap costs about $9. And, um, and we wanted to just evaluate those two trap types over um, a season. And um, what we found from our, our studies uh, was that the, the bucket trap tends to work, and we did this for two years, tend to work a lot better. Because um, in, in the summer, we tend to get heavy downpour of rain almost every afternoon, here, especially here in Florida. And those wind traps really cannot survive um, the, the heavy downpour. They, they, they tend to fall apart, so to speak. So um, uh, uh, even though they were cheaper, um, they only cost like $1.75. The problem is, is that the bucket traps, you can use this for, you know, uh, we had, we, we have bucket traps here that's 15 years old in, in my lab, 15 years old. So um, you can use them almost indefinitely for quite some time, the bucket traps, uh, whereas the wing trap, you can only use them for one season if you can use them for one season, because they, as I said, they're very susceptible to rainfall. So we found out and started recommending to growers here that uh, grape growers that they should use the bucket traps um, for monitoring this pest. Um, the other thing too is that uh, when we started this work, uh, we wanted to look at, because there are several different types of bucket traps that are available for, for uh, monitoring Lacodopteran or, or moths. You, you have blue, yellow, white, and, and green. So we compared all those traps um, and, and what we found, although we, and this was done in a random, randomized complete block design experiments and so forth, which I'm not gonna get into, but what we found was that um, the green and the, and the yellow trap um, tends to work very well. Uh, the white and the blue um, performed uh, a, a lot less effective, put it that way. The, the problem with the yellow trap is that we realized that the yellow trap was attracting quite a bit of beneficial insects, uh, some of those same um, yellow jackets and so forth. And, uh, and also bees as well too. So we decided not to go with the yellow trap and we went with the green trap. Uh, the green trap was a lot more selective in terms of just catching quite a bit of the grapefruit borer itself. So this is the trap that's currently used now. It's used actually throughout the entire Southeast for monitoring um, grapefruit borer um, if you have a problem. So one of the things that I'm actually not showing today, um, and uh, you know, as I'm, talking about this, I probably should have included this slide, is that um, we did quite a bit of work also uh, um, looking at management of the grapefruit borer where we, we looked at um, different uh, pesticides and compare that with fermounds. And what we found was that using a fermound monitoring system, even though it might be a little bit more expensive, was more sustainable that as opposed to using the pesticide. In fact, I think most of the growers from Arkansas all the way to Florida right now who are trying to manage grapefruit borer population who has high population are using the fermion pest management. And all that work was done here in my lab um, back, in, uh, back in 2008 and 2009. Um, I, um, I was just thinking to myself, I should have included the, the, those two or three slides talking about developing a, a fermion pest management for grapefruit borer. Um, but one of the things I wanted to show you here was that 
this is 2005. This is the same farm that we worked on in 2005. And then we worked on the same farm in 2014, looking at um, um, grapefruit borer populations. And this is um, the flight of the, of the male, because we're using the female frame round to, to monitor the, the adults. And you can see the huge difference here. Um, well, well the, the population is a lot higher if you were to look at it in 2005. The problem is that we are having um, a peak population in 2005 around late August, and then it falls off. Um, again, this is the same farm we're using, but in 2014, what we noticed, which was pretty shocking to us, was, was that the population was higher from the very start of the, of the monitoring, and we started almost the same time. You see 715 and 716, and the population was much higher early in the season. Not only that, we were seeing two peaks. Um, this is a, a semi-peak and this is a full peak here, so we call it bimodal peaks in, in terms of the population. And that was, again, very interesting to us. And at the end of the season, uh, we usually stop this work around October. We were still getting very high population. If you look at 2005, you'd realize in, in, in September, the population already crashed. Here, the population was still very high um, in, in the middle of September. And we have some data where we see the population continues all the way down to December, even though it was relative, relatively cold. Um, in December. So we are seeing increases, increasing population, so to speak, with um, root borer. Again, this is the same farm. Um, and we did quite a bit of management on this farm in terms of using um, traps, in terms of using pheromones and so on. So we had, when we stopped working on this farm in 2009 or 2010, we had reduced the population almost to zero. Um, you could hardly find any grapefruit borer there. And then over a period of time, I guess we didn't do much work between 2010 on, and 2014. When we went back to the same farm in 2014, we, we, we got this almost like a shock to us and we saw these types of results. Um, I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about the effect of woodlands, adjacent woodlands on, um, on grapewood borer population, something that we found, um, some work we did, did up in Live Oak at the experiment station there. And this is the, 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 the vineyard here, Google, Google Maps. And this is the adjacent woodlands. And basically what we did, uh, this is adjacent woodlands. We put traps um, in the vineyards, uh, in the vineyard. And then we also put some traps on the border of the woodlands and also within the woodlands and also at the edge of the, um, of the vineyard itself, uh, just to look at population movement and abundance um, within the, the vineyard itself. And basically what we found, um, but this was uh, a little surprising to us, but um, it was interesting information. And this was work that, that we did back in 2013. Um, the, this represent, if you look at the, the, the population of grape with borough males, again, we're using a female pheromone. These are the dates down here, and this represent uh, the different. This graph up here at the very top represent in the population in the vineyard. It tells you that the population in the vineyard was the highest. The one at the very bottom represent the population in the woodlands. It tells you that the, when we did this monitoring that we are getting less grape root borer in the woodlands itself. Uh, at the edge of the of the vineyard, this one represent the edge of the vineyard. The, the one just below the the, um, the 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 vineyard represent the edge of the vineyard, and the one below that one represent the edge of the of the woodlands. So basically, what it's telling us from this research that we did here was the fact that um, so we, we were thinking that at the end of the season, uh, maybe in late uh, October, November. The the um, the grapefruit borer would move from the vineyard back into the um, into the woodlands, and we were about to develop a pest management program to intercept them before they enter the field. But we realized after doing this work that the actual borer itself was overwintering within the vineyard itself because we were finding them in the vineyard from the very start of the operation. 
So this, again, uh, we find it to be interesting. Again, um, if you were to look at the difference between the woodlands here, the woodlands down here, um, and within the vineyard itself, you, you'll find the difference in terms of the population. So the management program would have to be different, so to speak. Um, let me give you an idea here. Now, based on some work that we have done before, uh, if the population was high in the woodlands, what we would have done is to put up what we call border traps or border sprays. And this would have intercepted those adults from moving into the vineyard itself. Uh, we could also do the same thing using fremont pest management. But because they were in the in the, the the vineyard already, we had to develop other pest management programs like spraying and so on within the field to, to reduce that resident population, so to speak. So some of the conclusions that, that uh, we, we, we did here was that the bucket traps was the best trap. It's much better than the wing trap. Uh, the green was much better than the yellow because the yellow um, tends to attract beneficial insects, including pollinators. And then we noticed that there's big differences um, between the population of um, Grapewood Borough in 2005 and 2014, I think it was. And um, in that there's, there is tendency of higher population and longer population um, in 2014 compared to 2005. And then the highest captures were within the vineyard itself, the grape vineyard as, as opposed to the, to the woodlands. I'm going to switch and talk a little bit. Uh, let me see what I have here. Okay, good. Switch and talk a little bit about um, a grapevine aphids. Um, again, aphid is the, is the second most important pest, so to speak, in, um, in, in muscadine grapes. Again, we are very lucky that we are growing muscadine grapes because uh, they tend to be fairly resistant to a lot of pests. And by the way, I think the, the previous speaker was asking about Drosophila suzukii. Um, most of the research that I have seen um, in the north, well, I, I think our lab, my, my lab here, and also um, lab in Virginia has done quite a bit of work looking at uh, the susceptibility of muscadine grapes to, to Drosophila suzukii. And what we found was that although um, Drosophila suzuki, suzukii was capable of or had the potential of um, laying the egg within muscadine grapes, it don't usually do it very often, especially if there are other host fruits around. If there are other fruit that they can lay their eggs into, they will choose that because it's, it's too difficult for them to penetrate the skin of the muscadine grapes. In experiments where we compared uh, muscadine with some of those northern varieties, they were 10 times more likely to lay their eggs in the northern variety compared to, to uh, muscadine. So, uh, that's not something you have to worry about too much. Um, uh, you know, I think it can be managed very effectively with some of the pesticides that they have, especially things like the organophosphates, like the malathion and uh, the imidan, and also some of the synthetic pyrethroids like the, the mustang and, and, and danitol and so forth. Uh, this, I just thought about responding to that because I, somebody asked a question about Drosophila Suzuki, I think, in, in the previous session. Now, with grapevine aphid, uh, um, it's, it's a pest that we see in muscadine grapes within the last couple of years. Um, it's, it's, a native, it's native to the United States and um, it occurs also in Central and South America. Uh, one of the interesting thing here is that we are finding it quite a bit um, in wild grapes and we have some current experiments as we speak right now where we are monitoring their population in wild grapes and comparing and contrasting um, the population with what we are seeing within the vineyard itself and we are seeing um, interesting things in that the population could be higher sometimes in the wild grapes as opposed to the to, to the vineyard. So the wild grapes is, is a source of infestation for the vineyard itself. Um, in north central Florida uh, we start seeing those population of grapevine aphid in um, around April and it continues all the way until October. Um, this is a picture that we took here last year. A lot of us took the picture of the aphid. Um, and, 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 and please remember that we have both a winged formed 
and also um, an, an unwinged um, or the wingless form of the aphid itself. This is how it looks. Um, the day, if you just walk into the vineyard, this is what you're going to actually see. The, the, the young vines uh, tends to be inundated with this, with this aphid. Um, and, and it can be very devastating because what it does, because of the, 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 the mouth parts of the aphid, it tends to get into the plant and start sucking that cells up. And um, that can interfere with the growth of the vine itself. And, and, and it could also interfere with subsequent harvesting um, of, of grapes from those vines. So it's, it, it can be a, a big problem, so to speak. Um, yeah, and, and not only that, the, 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 because of the reproduction of aphids, they tend to reproduce under ideal condition every couple of days. So the population can explode very quickly. So, um, there is also some information, and, and again, Susan Webb, um, one of my former uh, our colleague, a um, good friend of mine who, who retired from here, has reported that they are capable of transmitting um, viruses to, to vegetable crops. Uh, again, I have not seen that because I have not thoroughly investigated it. So one of the things that we wanted to do is to look at the population of, of um, this grapevine aphid within vineyards. And we wanted to do it throughout the entire year because there is no data currently available in the United States about this. And then we wanted to look at some of the compounds that can be used to control it, this grapevine aphid. And then we wanted to uh, look at the effects of some of these products that we're using on, on, on biological control because we realize that biological control could be an effective way to um, to reduce the population. So um, some of my stud students or postdocs from my, from my lab, they went down to Citra and they set up some, some research work. We looked at four cultivars, Alachua, Carlos, Noble, and Triumph. And uh, they set up some traps and also they were collecting leaves and they were sampling um, five young leaves um, per cultivar once per week over a period of time. And this was done, again, this, this is going on um, from April all the way down to October. And basically what we found, uh, if you were to look at these, uh, let me try and do this pretty quickly for you. Uh, Carlos is in the, the uh, what do you call this, um, orange. And you can see the, the population of, this is number of aphids on the y-axis. And these are the sampling dates, which starts from January 2019th, all the way up until September um, of 2019th. And um, 2019, um, you can see the, the different um, uh, varieties. Carlos is all the way down here, the orange. And this tells you that the population for some reason um, or oh, Ocalus is not very susceptible based on the information we have to this particular aphid for some reason, we don't know. This needs further research, obviously. Um, but when you look at something like Triumph, you can see that um, high populations um, of Triumph um, tends to uh, harbor this aphid itself. Um, uh, or Triumph tends to harbor, harbor high population of this aphid itself. Um, there were much, not much difference between Carlos and Noble, as you can see between here, but they, they were uh, a little bit more resistant, if you want to call it that, than the actual Triumph, and, and, um, but not as well as the, as the Carlos down here. So this is the life cycle. Well, basically what we are seeing here is a peak of this aphid around uh, May, between May and um, June. Um, I would say for a month, we are seeing the peak here, um, fairly high populations when during the spring as well. Um, the spring population tends to be relatively high in the fall, it starts falling off very quickly and um, eventually going to zero. So in terms of um, looking and, and, and what we are doing here, if you look at these, these pesticides that we are uh, evaluating for managing um, grapevine aphid, we're using some of the more um, recent pesticides, recent in terms of uh, they're being very 
safe, relatively safe pesticides. They are what we call reduced risk pesticide. And we also looked at the, a conventional pesticide, which is malathion. Malathion has been around for a very long time. It's very conventional. Um, and um, some people uh, don't like using it because it has negative effects on some of the beneficial insects. Movento is a relatively new pesticide um, in grapes and also in other crops. Delegate is uh, supposed to be a relatively safe pesticide. Again, um, Delegate is from the spinosad group. Um, 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 in fact, one formulation of this of the spinosad group is Entrus, which is labeled for organic use. Um, this one here, Delegate, obviously is not labeled for organic use, but it's it's a relatively safe pesticide. Xrel is also um, um, a fairly new pesticide. Um, it's been around for just for a couple of years. And it's also considered as reduced risk. So we have a reduced risk as well, um, delegate, movento. Malathion is the only conventional products we have. And we compare that with an untreated control um, for the experiments. This is the vineyard where we did some of this work. Um, and if you look at the, the chart we have here, you will see that the results from, the, um, from this pesticide trial. OK, let me see if I can go over this pretty quickly. Delegate. You can see delegate here, which is in the orange color. You can follow the delegate. You can see that early in the season, um, when we applied the pesticide, um, there was fairly high population, about 40 aphids were averaging, but after we applied delegate, the population falls off very quickly and it remained fairly low um, until the end of the season. I, I mean, we, we didn't make a second application on May 30th and a final application in June. And, but delegate, you can see, reduce aphid population. When we look at um, uh, XRL, um, this was really surprising because XRL is supposed to be a reduced risk and one of the newer compounds out, uh, the, 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 the results wasn't looking too promising because although it initially knocks off the population, XRL is the one in gray, you can see very quickly the population rebound rebound and um, even though we use a, a, another spray on the 30th of May and another spray on June, the population still remained relatively high. And this was pretty surprising for us to see this, knowing that XRL is a new compound and there's a lot of investment that went into to this product, it's XRL. The compound uh, malathion, which has been around for decades now, um, again, some people don't like using it because it's, uh, it's not very, um, beneficial uh, when it comes to uh, the, 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 um, the, the, the beneficial insects, so to speak. Um, malathion is in the yellow. You can see after we use the malathion, it knocks the aphid population down very quickly and the aphid population remained low all the way until the end of the season. Movento was pretty shocking here. And I think we, well, one of the first to show that Movento works very well. In fact, the company Bayer gets, Get, got very excited about this, that, that Movento was knocking down the aphid population from the very start and, and the population remains really low throughout the entire season. So from the reduced risk pesticides, and when we say reduced risk, these pesticides don't pose a big risk to, to the beneficial insects. That's why we call them reduced risk. Uh, Malathion is not reduced risk, so it poses some risk. So the reduced risk pesticides that works really well here, things like the Movento, and the delegate that works very well. XRL for some reason didn't work well and malathion um, tend to work well uh, for controlling the aphids because we need to be able to, to identify tools that can be used to manage the aphid population. Now, if you were to go to the vineyard and look at the aphid population, you'd realize that um, you'll find quite a bit of these types of insects. Um, they're referred to as um, parasitoid. And what they are doing, these are beneficial insects. What they're actually doing, they're laying their eggs into the body of the aphid itself. And then the, the larvae develops and what eventually happened, the aphid becomes parasitized. I mean, once it becomes parasitized, it looks like this. It looks like a, an engulfed tick, so to speak. And this, this is when you know it's parasitized. And in other words, it cannot function like a normal aphid. It can, it, 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 it's on its way out, out, so to speak, after the eggs are laid and the larvae start developing inside. So, um, so what we wanted to do, and these are very common, these parasitoid, um, 
Lysifilibus testicipes. It's very common in, in vineyards. Um, you know, if you can walk in your vineyard, you probably would find one of this insect within, if, if you don't search for it, within 10 minutes or so. Um, and we wanted to look at some of the pesticides, the effects of these pesticides on this particular biocontrol agent, which is responsible for, for the reduction in the aphid population. We also wanted to look at another common predator, which is in the, the vineyard itself, which is called Aureus insidious. And this one does quite a bit in terms of feeding on, on some of the Lepidopterans eggs. I guess what time it is. Okay, great. I have to check my time because I have a way of going over time sometimes. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the Aureus insidious, it's another beneficial insect in the, in the vineyard, very common as well too. And we wanted to look at the pesticide, the effects on, on Aureus. So we, we did some work um, in the laboratory looking at the same pesticide and um, where we exposed uh, pretty much the, the, the pesticides in, in petri dishes to these to the to the parasitoid and also to the predator, which is aureus. And we look at mortality over 24, 48, and 72 hours. Um, um, and, and this is the data here. We looked at it at zero, three, and seven days. Um, you know, at zero day, what happened at zero day, what happened at three days, and what happened at seven days. And if you look at this, you can see that um, the control here is the one in black where we didn't apply any pesticide at all. So there was 0% mortality, so to speak. Um, you know, I think after a while, having them in the petri dish, we had one or two um, dying. Um, you know, normally it's, it's, it's really a flat curve. Uh, you can see that, again, we found the same thing <laughs> that we found in the field when we use the, the pesticide XRL. It's not, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 it's not very effective in terms of suppressing the aphid. You can see that XRL population here I mean, it kills some of it, obviously, 25%, about 25% mortality, but it's nothing like when we looked at Movento, Malathion, and Delegate. The, 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 the Malathion is at the top here, which is the most effective because we had 100% mortality. Then we have followed by Delegate, which we had about 80% mortality, or a little, maybe a little above 80%. And then we had Movento here, where we had um, about 60 to 70% mortality. So we find the same thing in the laboratory. Um, and, and this is on the parasitoids that we found in the field. So that was interesting um, for us because the same pesticide that is killing the pest was actually killing this particular parasitoid. So we're trying to figure out how to deal with this. Um, and again, if you look at three days and also the seven days, um, the results were pretty much very similar, uh, except, um, well, sorry, at three days, the results were very similar, but at seven days, the results were different. Um, what we found at seven, day, seven days, when I say seven days, um, we spray the pesticide, and then at zero day, we exposed the parasitoid to it. We spray the pesticide, and then three days after, we exposed the parasitoid to it. So we did not see a difference between zero and three days, but at seven days, we saw a significant difference. And this is where we can give some advice to growers who wants to use things like, um, with the exception of malathion, because seven days after, if you look at malathion down here, you realize the malathion was still killing everything. Um, however, what we saw was that even though Delegate was, was the second most toxic pesticide to the parasitoid, Things like the Movento, which was really good news, uh, was working very well in terms of keeping the parasitoid alive. So one of the things that we are telling growers now is that they can use Movento as a management tool for aphid. And this is fairly new information, so to speak. And this came out last year. And they can also continue to use Delegate, although they risk killing some of their, their um the parasitoid that, that usually kills, it, which is the biocontrol agent for the aphid itself. Um, this is the data when we look at the aureus, the other beneficial insect in the system. Um, this was a little bit different to the parasitoid. Um, this again is zero day, this is three days, and this is seven days. And what we found was that, and, and let me tell you here, um, 
when we look at, um, let me see, 20, this blue represent the 24 hours, um, 40, yellow is the 48 hours, and, um, and gray is the 72 hours um, at zero days, at zero days. In other words, zero days after we spray the pesticide, we expose it to the, to the, to the predator, which is aureus. Uh, but you can see here that um, obviously there's no mortality using XRL, which is pretty similar to what we see with the parasitoid. With um, malathion, interestingly, malathion kills all of it um, at zero day, and Movento also kills all of it at zero day. Um, and you can see um, some differences, a little differences, not, not too significant with delegate. But again, at seven days after, look at what happens. Um, three days was pretty, uh, a little different to zero day, but look at the seven day. We are seeing big differences. Movento literally did not kill any, any of that beneficial insect after seven days, Movento. The same thing with XRL, but XRL is not effective against the aphid, so we're not interested in the XRL. Um, delegate, um, surprisingly, delegate, uh, which is a very common pesticide, killed quite a few of this um, predator um, after seven days. So again, we started recommending very strongly the, the, the Movento. So this basically summarized some of our findings from the aphids that the low number of aphids were recorded in, in Carlos, which are pointed out very clearly. Carlos appears to be a little bit uh, more resistant to this aphid. Um, uh, the reduced risk insecticides delegate and Movento um, provided very good control for the grapevine aphid. XRL, as you see, did not provide any control for it. And when we use the biocontrol agent, um, uh, we have to be very careful when we're using it. In other words, we should uh, only, if we have control, and, and sometimes we can, not sometimes, we can buy some of these products and release them into the, into the vineyard, uh, we are saying seven days after is, is a good time to release some of these biocontrol, both the aureus and with the um, and with the parasitoid itself. And Movento is the best compound. It's very compatible with both the bio, with both biological control agent, especially after seven days. Now I'm going to spend a little bit of time here and talk about some other pests that you see in the. These, these are secondary pests. The two pests I discussed first, um, which is the grapefruit borer and the um, aphid. Those are the those are key pests. A key pest is a pest which is problematic in terms of uh, attacking your crop, and not only attacking your crop, but it causes what we call economic damage, economic damage to your crop. These secondary pests I'm going to be talking about very quickly, they don't cause economic damage unless you really uh, mismanage them in terms of just allow the population to continue without any check. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they refer to a secondary pest. And they are very common also in muscadine grapes. Um, Flea beetles, uh, obviously, you probably have seen this. Um, it's, it's a little small, black, metallic, jumping beetle, very small beetle. It's only 532 of an inch. Uh, some of them are black, some of them are purplish black, so to speak. And when, once you touch the, the leaf, they tends to jump all over the place. Um, the, the, the adults tend to feed on the leaf and um, they, 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 they make what we call shot holes in the leaves. And sometimes they feed on the buds, the, the, the buds of the plant. Um, you'd also find that um, don't get mixed up when you saw when you when you see things like this in the field. Uh, this is the larvae of the flea beetle. Um, a lot of people have called me thinking that it's a different insect, but it's the same insect. This is the larvae part that looks a little bit different. This is the adults. Um, both larvae and adults actually feed on the on the, on the, on the vine itself. Um, management of flea beetles is, uh, is we always tend to use pyrethroids, and when we talk about pyrethroids, we're thinking that in terms of things like Mustang, Mustang, Danatol, and um, um, we, I, I have listed it Imidan. Imidan is really an organ of phosphate. That can also be used, although we don't use it too often, but the, the Danatol and Mustang is a very common products used to control um, flea beetles. And, and again, these are secondary pests, so they, they don't pose too much of a problem. The other thing I wanted to talk just briefly about is the glassy wing sharpshooter. You've heard a lot about this particular insect. Um, is, is, it vectors um, the, the, the bacteria that uh, that, um, that transmits um, uh, pieces diseases in, of grapes 
Fortunately for us, um, Pacis disease is not a big problem in muscadine grapes because of the fact that muscadine, again, tends to be fairly resistant to Pacis disease. Um, it's, it's fairly resistant. Um, so in terms of developing a management program for glassed wing sharp shooter, um, my lab hasn't really been focused on that because it's a secondary pest. We don't have issues with that in, in muscadine grapes. Although if you were growing Northern grapes, some of the, um, uh, the, 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 you know, the hybrids and so forth, then you would have a lot of issues with um, um, glass and ring stuff shooter. Please wrap um, it up great. quickly. We've exceeded our time now. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, uh, I have one more slide after this, I think. Yeah, one more slide. Let me just go to, okay. this is a yep. grape, grape leaf folder, grape leaf folder. Um, it's, it's a pest that causes the actual um, leaves of the grapes to fold, um, as it says. And, um, you know, any Lepidopterus pest could be controlled with things like BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, or you can use Entrust. Entrust is, is part of the Spinosad group. Or you can use Delegate. Delegate also tends to be very effective when it comes to suppressing some of these um, Lepidopterus pests. And then my very last slide, I think here, um, I want to, is, is Mealybug. Mealybug is a secondary pest again in grapes. Um, you can manage, this is what happens um, when, when it gets out of control. It tends to feed on the actual fruit itself and create a problem when it comes to marketing the, the actual grape itself. Uh, um, horticultural oils are very effective um, uh, because it, 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 it glues up the entire system, preventing the, the, the mealybugs from reproducing. And sometimes you have to use uh, neonicotinoids, pesticides, things like imidacorporate is pretty good. Uh, chlorothyridine is also um, uh, effective, especially when you, when you have light textured soils. Uh, thymothoxin can be used if the soil is a little bit more heavy, if you have clay type soils. And dino, dinotifuran is also um, effective on some of these heavy soils. Movento, which is a fairly new pesticide, also work well in terms of suppressing uh, mealybugs. This is my lab group. Um, these are the people that do all the work here. And I want to thank them for, for their significant contributions. Thank you. Are uh, there any questions? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I know I everybody... feel pretty yeah. quickly, um, <laughs> but I wanted to share some of, the, some of our work. Um, yeah, and I'm, I focus on those things that are problems within our system, so to speak. Before people leave, remember that uh, in the chat room, I posted the exit survey link and please do take that exit survey. And if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box there for Dr. Liebert. And can you, can you read those questions for me, please, if you don't mind? Yeah. Yes, there's if, none if, there. If, if there are any questions, yeah. Okay, still no questions. Oh, here we have one. Um, well, excellent, excellent and actionable information. Thank you, we'll use this for my growers. <laughs> as a comment, thank you very much. I appreciate that, yeah. You know, um, yeah, if you type fruit and vegetable and my name library, you know, feel free to send me emails about this, you know, any, any pest problems you have in your grapes, um, that'd be, Happy to respond to you as, you know, as these questions come in, so to speak. Yeah.